Bail Amendment Bill Committee Stage. I declare the House in Committee for consideration of the Bail <coughs> Amendment Bill. Mr Speaker. Mr Chairman. Members, uh, the House and Committee on the Bail Amendment Bill. Uh, <laughs> the question is that part one stand up. A point of order, Honourable Chris. Mr. Speaker, oh, Mr. Chairman, sorry, I seek leave for the uh, for all stages of the Bail Amendment Bill to be debated as one question, with all questions to be put to the vote at the end of the debate. Separately. Yep. Leave is sought for that purpose. Is there anyone opposed to that course? There is none. Uh, leave is agreed. The question is that parts one and two, parts one and two clauses one, two and three stand part. Andrew Little. Mr Chairman, I rise to uh, speak at this very important phase of the passage of the Bail Amendment Bill. And as will be apparent from the earlier stages of the bill, Labor uh, supports this bill, but with considerable uh, concern and reservations about some aspects of it. We understand, of course, the growing community concern about the numbers of those of offenders who, uh, having been granted bail, continue to commit offences while on bail, and in particular those offenders who have previous convictions uh, of, for serious offences uh, who find themselves offending again and are uh, facing a bail application. And so their legislation in response to community concerns, uh, now reverses the onus for an applicant for bail and requiring, in some circumstances, the applicant for bail to establish that um, they should be granted bail or that uh, they are not a risk if uh, should bail be granted. There are important principles that need to be balanced, not the least of which a fundamental principle in criminal justice is that a, uh, a person charged with an offence is considered innocent until proven guilty. Uh, but next, there is the principle that the courts have a responsibility in managing offenders, uh, both pre-conviction and post-conviction, uh, to protect public safety. Uh, and one of the balancing factors that uh, combines or that draws those two together is that the minimum restraint uh, necessary that is consistent with those two principles should be applied to a person so that uh, a person who is charged with an offence yet to be established but who poses a risk to public safety uh, uh, should face the minimum restraint necessary to ensure public safety. Uh, and another a very important principle, Mr Chairman, in my view, is that uh, judges with the best information available to them uh, must be regarded as in the best position to judge the appropriate cause of action. It's become increasingly common and popular uh, for there to be widespread commentary on the decisions that judges take, but the reality is we seldom see in the public arena all of the information that a judge has before him or herself in making that decision. And so, Mr Chairman, all those factors need to be balanced uh, to determine what is uh, an appropriate course of action to take in the contemporary or latter-day circumstances of the administration of criminal justice. On those grounds and on that basis, Mr Chairman, we accept that there are grounds for reversing the burden, burden of proof in an application for bail in some cases. And this legislation uh, in, one, in one clause refers, refers specifically to the onus of proof being reversed in relation to charges of murder, and the starting point is that bail will not be granted, but that a judge may grant bail. And then there is the uh, clause that deals with a range of very serious offences, uh, and so there is a heightened burden for those offences as well. And it needs to be made clear, Mr Chairman, and we accept that this bill, uh, should it be passed, does not deny bail, certainly does not de deny bail automatically to any offender, but it does uh, increase the threshold that has to be met by an offender before bail is granted, where there is an obvious risk. And that risk is usually um, 
established by looking at their past track record and certainly reoffending while on bail, um, uh, that uh, certainly increases the risk that a judge is entitled to take into account. So we understand that and we accept that. We understand also the bill uh, ensures that police bail now is to be managed and treated in the, largely in the same way as court managed bail. So we accept those provisions um, that, uh, and they achieve, they strike a good balance of the principles that I uh, set out earlier. Mr Chairman, uh, three particular areas where we are concerned, um, and they are the SOPs that have one, one from the Minister and two from um, the member Richard Prosser. Uh, the Minister's SOP, there are many technical changes in there. There is one that causes me particular concern, and that is the proposed new Section 30E in the Minister's SOP that creates, a, whereas at the moment the Department of Mr Chairman, oh, Andrew Little. whereas at the moment the Department, uh, sorry, the, the, the uh, police are responsible for monitoring um, uh, those who have given, given electronic bail um, while on remand. Uh, this SOP uh, says that the Minister, the Minister of Justice, can give the authority to manage electronic bail to either the, the Commissioner of Police or to the Chief Executive of the Department of Corrections. And it is not cl clear why both should be given this responsibility. Um, but even if it were, we were convinced that it was a good idea, that it should be shared b between those two uh, departments who are dealing, who are, lie at the heart of our criminal justice system, then the next question is, on what basis should that discretion to grant authority for monitoring electronic bail be given? And there is no signal given in the legislation uh, as to how the Minister would exercise that discretion. Is, that, is the discretion going to be exercised in relation to different regions of New Zealand? Is it simply going to be, well, you know, the police, you can manage, uh, uh, monitor electronic bail on oh, the Department of Corrections, you can as well, and you just sort it out amongst yourselves. Is there going to be an MOU between the two departments? Or what is going to be the story? Or what is the basis on which the Minister will exercise a discretion to give the authority for monitoring electronic bail to either or both departments? Uh, I think it's fair, Mr Chairman, that we hear what those grounds might be and what the distinction might be between uh, the two departments. And we might hear from the Minister uh, what she considers would be the most effective arrangement. Is it going to be the, the police for some situations and the Department of Corrections for others? And if so, what? And uh, to give a clear steer on how that discretion might be exercised. That's, that's often given in the primary legislation uh, and in fact it should, it should be there in the primary legislation. In relation to the SOPs 334 and 335, uh, I simply want to record, Mr Chairman, that we are opposed to those uh, SOPs. They are draconian. They do not achieve any sort of balance in the administration of justice when it comes to bail applications. Uh, they reduce the, thres the threshold against which uh, bail might be granted. And uh, 334 dealing specifically with... <coughs> and um, 334 dealing specifically... Uh, with the situation where somebody is, is charged with an offence but not yet convicted. And whereas the, the, the bill as it is at the moment says that if an offender has a conviction for the particular offence for which they are now facing another charge and are seeking bail, then it is a relevant factor for the judge to say, well, uh, the, the owner starts with you and the starting point is that you don't get bail. Mr Prosser's uh, SAP 334 would say, well, it doesn't matter whether or not the offender has a conviction, simply being charged is enough. Now that is so far contrary to the principle of uh, innocent before proven guilty that uh, in our view, Mr Chairman, we simply cannot abide by that SOP and we will not be supporting it. And the second SOP in Mr Pross's name, SOP 335, deals with, the, uh, with younger offenders uh, and uh, the situation in which an offender has not been imprisoned for an offence in terms of assessment of their risk, but has been uh, has a conviction for an offence for which 
uh, imprisonment is a possible sentence. So they may not have been imprisoned at all, which suggests that their offending would be at the lower end of the offending and does not suggest a greater risk if that offender is facing a subsequent bail application for a similar offence. So, Mr Chairman, we say that simply draws the bow way too long and gets the balance way out of kilter. So we will not be supporting those SOPs. But on the whole, bearing in mind the principles that we've articulated, we support this bill, but do simply remind the House that when it comes to criminal justice, our job is to make sure that the law not only uh, ensures that the guilty are convicted and are dealt with, but that the innocent are treated properly and appropriately and their rights properly protected. I call uh, Richard Prosser. Thank you, Mr Chair. I